Welcome back. Um, we uh, started our journey looking at this great verse that we've, the topic has been given for Autumn Soul um, uh, 2020, um, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And we've looked at the idea of uh, what does the Lord require of you. I challenged, I suppose, myself along with you around our prayer lives that we'll talk a little bit more as we go through the weekend. Big question, all right? Um, in all the years that I've been a Christian, I've often asked, or is God and, and, and myself passionate about the same thing? Am I and God passionate about the same things? I know what I'm passionate about. I, I like different things. I like cars. My wife tells me that anything I put fuel in, I like. So I like cars. I like motorbikes. I like that sort of stuff. Um, um, things for me and about me. I know that. But when, it, when, when I really think about it, I start to wonder, what is God passionate about? Um, and in Scripture, I find, of course, uh, uh, you'll know this verse, I hope, in John 3, 16, that God is passionate about the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And so God loved us so much that he gave us a special gift. And true love always costs something. Um, so to say you love God and you're not willing to give him your all, um, well, then it just gets to be empty words, doesn't it? And semantics, really. Christian lingo that is hollow and um, we've grown up in a little country that's been used to loads of Christian lingo. Knowing that God loved the world, the entire world. I, I, I remember as a boy wanting to know more about that beyond my comfortable world of me and mine. And I wanted more to know more about this and obey him. And so um, uh, there are so many injustices in the world in which we live. Many of them, they, they tell us, the UN figures tell us that um, probably 25,000 children die every day with hunger or hunger-related causes. Um, they tell us that probably nearly 2 million children are exploited into the global sex trade. Um, 27 million slaves in the world today, according to National Geographic. So what is God's plan? What is God's plan for making it believable that he is good? Well, Here's the good news for you. You are the plan. I am the plan. God has chosen people to be his plan. So my hands, my feet, my mouth and yours are what God has chosen us to be. And in Matthew 5, um, here's what it says, Matthew 5, 14, you and I are the light of the world. It doesn't say you could be or it doesn't say, I sure hope you might be someday. It says we are. We are. I love Isaiah 61, the first three verses. Let me read them to you. It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We are not reflectors. We are not like a moon that reflects the light of the sun and transmits it out. No, 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 no. That's not what we are as believers. We are the people of God in whom light dwells. So if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, uh, and I hope you are, and if you're not, there'll be loads of opportunity over this weekend to actually accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if you are a believer, you are a person in whom that light dwells. This is why Paul could say in Colossians 1 that it's Christ in me that is the hope of glory. So he's in Christ actually dwells in me. So it's not a, a rise and uh, it's not a rise and reflect, it's a rise and shine. So there's something in us. So what is injustice? What is it? The word gets thrown around a lot today and gets watered down a little bit, I think, in our society. Is it when a car cuts out in me, it cuts me out in traffic? Um, I, I live down in a little estate and there's a yellow box at the end of my road. And um, man, I have to get grace every day for that yellow box because people just block me in all the time. Is that injustice? Is it when I'm in the 10 items or fewer line at Tesco's and the person in front of me has 12 or 13 items? 
Is that what injustice is? No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible is talking about. Injustice according to scripture is a sin. Injustice is the abuse of power. All right, it's when someone takes away another's life or liberty or dignity or the fruits of their love and labor. And this is what Solomon was getting at when he was writing in Ecclesiastes 4. I'm writing devotionals in Ecclesiastes at the minute and enjoying it. And here's what he said in verse 1 of chapter 4. He said, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed. They have no comfort or power was on the side of the oppressors and they have no comforter. So the big question that we looked at in the last session was what does the Lord require of us? And of course the answer in this verse comes in a threefold response beginning with act justly or in other words act with fairness, act with honesty, act with integrity. Because an awakened heart is one that has been shaken by the Holy Spirit into a a new awareness of God's presence and a, a new desire for that spiritual presence. And it is such a heart that will act justly. I love Psalm 62, verse 8, actually in the Amplified Bible. This is what it says. It says, trust in, lean on, rely on, have confidence in him, in God at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is a refuge for us, a fortress on a high tower. And then he says, Selah, pause and think about that. When was the last time you poured out your heart before him? Oh, that our hearts would come alive. That's, I know that's the desire of of the folks who have organized autumn soul. That's the desire of their hearts. It all starts in our hearts. And I'm asking you to become accountable to a holy God who requires you to value him above all others and seek him only. And that's why in Matthew 22, Jesus told his disciples that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Of course, you're to love your neighbor as yourself as well. And he said, on these two hang all the laws of the prophets, all 600 plus of them. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So to seek is to value what you go after. And I want to go after God. And I want you to go after God. That's the organizers of Autumn Soul want you to go after God. That's our heart's desire. So do you value a clean heart? My advice is go after it. Do you value a pure conscience? Go after it. Do you value or or want a deeper prayer life? Go after it. Do you value your walk with God? Go after it. Do you value an encounter with God that will redirect your will and soften your hearts towards him? Then go after it. I love, there's a little verse in 2 Chronicles 15, talks about Asa, and it said that Asa made a covenant to seek the Lord. How about it? Would you be willing in this um, year at Autumn Soul to make a covenant to seek the Lord? Will you make a covenant to revive your devotions? Will you make a covenant to act justly, to dump the rubbish out of your life, as it were, and to say to God, these are the best days of my life. This is my time. What about getting involved in church life more? What about getting involved, maybe helping out in some kind or form of compassion ministry? Do random acts of kindness, act justly before the Lord. It is time to seek God seriously. It is time to seek God persistently. Um, There's a little verse in Hosea 10, and it says that um, uh, it's time to seek the Lord and break up the, the fallow ground. And what that word follow means, it just means plowed ground that has become hard again. Plowed ground that has become hard again. So he's asking us to be serious. He's asking us like Matthew 7, 7, to ask and to seek and to knock, to be persistent. That's what Jesus was getting at when he told the story in Luke 18 of the persistent widow uh, with the judge. And he says, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Have you lost heart? Understanding timing and delay is a wonderful thing. When I was a boy of 11, I got saved quite very young and got saved when I was six. And when I was a boy of 11, I had an encounter with God at a little bridge on the way home from school, walking home from school. And I had this encounter day after day for months. And um, I, uh, I did what everybody does. I thought 
I, there was a call of God in my life, even as a boy, and I felt like it was going to come and something was going to unfold. But years went by and, and, and many trip ups came and actually planted a manual when I was 38 years of age, all of those years later. And then I began to realize as I looked through the Bible that Abram had to wait 20 years in the promise, Joseph 17 years, Paul 14 years, Jesus 30 years. So I began to realize that I was in good company. And here's the thing, between the promise and the actual, um, the, 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 the validation of the promise, Usually there's a delay, usually there's a time, and in that period of time, people slip up and people backslide and people get away from God. And here's my advice to you. God's suddenlies are built in graduals. I have never saw a suddenly that wasn't prefixed by a gradual. It's a divine law and established principle of the Bible. You trust in the Lord with all your heart, and I'm telling you, that suddenly will come, but it'll have to take the gradual that will lead into it. Day-to-day -day stuff, the daily grind of persistence, continuing to pray like Isaiah of old, that verse in Isaiah 64, 1. I was praying this this morning, actually. Oh, that you would burst the heavens and come down. Man, that suddenly is only going to be prefixed by a gradual where people get uncomfortable in their prayer lives. And here's the thing as we conclude this talk. Here's, you could do it in seven hours. In seven hours. Now, not time. They're just, I'm, I'm a brother and boy. And so seven things, beginning with the letter R. Here they are. Pray the impossible is reinstated. Pray all spiritual deadwood is removed. Pray that spiritual passions be restored. Pray that all spiritual attack will be resisted. Pray that all people groups will be reached. Pray for unexpected miracles to be received. And pray that our prayers will be rewarded to the ones who wait on God. Here's what the thing is. If we invite God into our lives and challenge you, your sonship, your daughtership today, to act justly before the Lord, to seek him with all of your heart. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then I'm, I'm asking you just even to pray a simple prayer. Just to repent of your sin. Say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I asked you that you would come in and fill me now with your presence, that you would be the Lord of my life and fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And if you were to pray that prayer, not just by the praying of the prayer, but do it with the sincerity of your heart, the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So may the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.